and welcome back. We have with us on set Emerson Gill. Mm -hmm. You're telling us that it's more than 100 years. No, no well, the, 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 what we're doing is we're calling out the year plus a few months uh, that is remaining for us to truly celebrate 100 years of Carvism in Belize. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, we, we have been at this now for quite some time and we're we are now waving the flag regionally and internationally that in fact Belize has not been properly placed in the pages uh, on the book of Garveyism. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could go back a little and map out for us what Garveyism is and what is the importance of it in Belize. <laughs> Garveyism is the cry for us to recognize who we are what we have contributed, how we have contributed to these nations where African descendants live. It's a cry for our black consciousness. It's a cry for our black spirituality to return. It's a cry for us to rebuild our economic yeah. programs. It's a cry for us to do the research and re-educate ourselves for the journey. And we're hoping that in the next year plus a few months, Belize will take on that task and let it become ours so that we can in fact fill these pages that has been void for so long. The, there's this misconception that part of Garvinism is repatriation. I think that was just an act because repatriation, is it going back to Africa or is it going back in, to yourself and, and, and regenerating a human person? because we have become less than if we accept uh, what is said, because we're described as criminals, lazy, good for nothing, uh, less than human. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the courts of the Isaiah Mata papers, we are, we are classified as less than humans in that document, because it says that Isaiah Mata could not leave his, his, uh, his uh, legacy to those people because they're less than humans. But originally there was, in fact, a mechanism to return physically to Africa. Oh, yes. And, and there were certificates was being sold on a ship called the Black Star Line. Black Star Line. Yes, but so that it was, was more than just a return to self. It was a call to actually go and recolonize Africa in the image of blackness. Yes, uh, and Liberia was the location. Uh, some millions of acres were given to the cars and then suddenly reneged. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> that's a whole other story. Well, I, and, and I think, yeah, let's, let's try to br bring it back with some kind of background. We were talking about uh, preparing for the 100 years of yes. Garveyism in Belize. We also uh, are looking at, we've seen you as the lead of the UNIA, uh, being the spokesperson and talking about uh, the work that you've been continuously trying to, uh, to, to execute here in Belize. Um, talk to us about who works along with you, the association itself, and uh, what your current objectives are. Okay, first of all, I have to give thanks to our president, David Obi, mm -hmm. who was on the forefront before me. Brother David. Brother, Brother David, David yeah. Obi, who also is, is instrumental in recognizing Ibo Tong, the community, uh, the Isaiah Mata statue at the end of Albert Street, uh, also one of the founding members, I believe, of Isaiah Mata Harambe, which was along with Bert Tucker, mm. uh, Galwin, yes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Lassell Bowen, and, and those elders who are now uh, ancestors. Uh, we're just following the script because Garveyism is not, does not change. Garveyism has a mandate. Uh, it's social, and it's spiritual, it's social, it's economical, mm -hmm. and it's environmental. And in that package, we are definitely lacking here in our own country. We have been, we have been uh, crying and giving this message now for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And the UNI in Belize is a fledgling thing because mm -hmm. it's only a few of us who, who actually read and try to get to understand and try to connect to the bigger, uh, wider diaspora who are, in fact, an Africanist and Garveyites doing the same work. Uh, in that regard, I have written a few things, and I did not know 
that I was being noticed by other Garveyites around the world. And it is because of them highlighting the flag we are waving, the red, black, and green, that we wave constantly about Belize and Isaiah Mata and his contribution and the work of the uh, Ambassador Bertoka in Namibia and all of this stuff. And then they say, but how come we don't know that? How come we here in Belize don't know that we've had Belizeans on the forefront of a black consciousness and a black independent struggle in other parts of the world, Belizeans? So we're going to try to highlight all of this over the next year plus a few months and get those pages written and, and publicized. You keep speaking about Isaiah Morinter, and before we started the show, one of the things uh, that you were speaking about was how important it is that it becomes more general knowledge for people growing up to know the contributions of Isaiah Morinter. Uh, there is a statue in Belize City. I don't know how many people know that. Um, I don't know if people know their contributions, his contributions. And, and one thing keeps popping in my mind because it reminds me so much of how long it took for us to broaden the conversation about Philip Goulson and his, his contributions. While it was kind of mentioned in circles of conversations, to the extent that it is now, it took a very long time. Yeah. Um, talk to us about how, first of all, who Isaiah Mortar is, and what is the most important thing that all Belizeans need to know about his contribution? Isaiah Mata was a simple man, work, ethics, impeccable. He was a farmer. He was a, he was a real estate developer. Uh, he traded. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that was the three parts of his empire that garnered him millionaire status at a very early time in Belize. Uh, Isaiah Mata's estate in international records that he left was supposed to be 210 square miles in Belize. Real estate plus land plus keys. Uh, currently, in my research, I can only cover 31 square kilometers. Mm. So we don't know where the rest is. Mm. Uh, but the research is being done. Uh, Isaiah Mata contributed in a tremendous way because of his work ethic. He did not like people who did not work. He did not like people who, including family members. Mm -hmm. And he in his will, he said, I will care for you. You can live in these buildings, but you can do nothing with it. You can't sell it. You can't transfer it. Everything he bequeathed to African redemption. And his family took his estate to court and lost. Mm. So when we talk about Isaiah, we are still trying to turn over the rocks to find all of the little gems at the National Library, between myself and uh, uh, Attorney Sharon Pitts, we were able to do some research and come up with 272 pages that is now lodged at the National Library. So in fact, for those of us who want to read, they can actually go to the library and, and pull the Isaiah Mata papers, and they will find the court history. They will find some of his rental records and some of the things that we have been able to put together. But that's only a little piece mm -hmm. of something that should be done. I think that our university should make that a uh, prerequisite for history research in Belize. I think it's important that it is given that kind of uh, importance, because it is. Mm -hmm. He contributed to the UNIA. He contributed the first money for the first ship. Uh, and, and when I think Marcus Garvey did not hear him, he went to New York and he gave Marcus Garvey his personal message. In other words, even though he respected Garvey for what he was doing, he also saw that Garvey may have been missing the economic boat because he himself was economically viable. So he was showing Garvey, look to the land, look to agriculture, look to, look to those kinds of things that were a tangible part of uh, what he was calling reparation and what he was calling uh, uh, economic viability, because mm -hmm. Garvey then was doing 
the aircrafts and transportation business, uh, cleaning, bellhop. He was, he was creating, he, uh, organizing people on every level. If, because there's, there's a bigger um, conversation here, in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Garveyism was one of my favorite topics during my degree in political science. And um, one, of the, one of the things about, about it for, for us, I think it's an important juncture for a discussion in blackness in Belize because of where our news cast is going. Um, young black males in this country are lost. They lack identity, they lack ownership, they lack placement in society. And even though Garvism might not be the answer to the boy in their lives, it surely sparks a conversation that gives them something to cling on to. And so, in extension of that, I, I'd like you to talk about where the actual footprints of UNIE have on who the positive side of what black people are in Belize. Because again, every time we watch news, black people almost are like, I mean, we're looked at as almost like a pariah, a nuisance. We are only good to fill news stories. Mm -hmm. And we know that UNIE has given us, and the whole government has given us Rastafarianism, extension mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, we've had local um, movements, UBAD has mm -hmm. come but can you talk to, to us about the relevance of the young black male out there? Well, let's look at in the league. <laughs> let's look at uh, Vivian C, for instance. She was an educator, a nurse, a community developer, a political movement developer before we even had PUP, UDP, and those things. She was already creating a political movement in the twenties, thirties. Mm. You see, so. And then, again, the Liberty Hall is the bastion of meeting, the public meeting, where UBAD was founded, where the PUPs had meetings, where the NIPs had meetings, where, where we gathered to talk about social issues, where we discovered that, in fact, we could run our own lives and our own society. From inside of that building, those decisions were made. Uh, it is amazing that it is in the condition yeah. that it is, well, I, knowing all of this. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I, I really wanted to touch on that, because Liberty Hall, and I really would love for us to be able to expand the conversation between, bef beyond our individual knowledge. Because one of the things that I challenge you to answer is, what is, what would you consider to be the widespread knowledge of Isaiah Mortar, Marcus Garvey, what UNIA is? If you ask one of these young men mm. who are going on a perp walk what that is, who they represent, what are the principles, I dare to say they won't be able to tell you the answer. Guaranteed. And the current status, if you look at the dilapidation of Liberty Hall, it seems almost equivalent to what the message is behind what it stood for. And perhaps that's part of what is missing in the conversation. Uh, when you want to speak about celebrating a hundred years of something, when there is no foundation for the information, and coupled with that, there aren't many younger faces getting involved as well. So tell me about that part. Uh, Garveyism is the antidote to oppression. Yeah. Period. But it can only be the antidote if people know of it. It's like saying there's a vaccine to fix something, but nobody knows the vaccine exists. Okay. Let's let's look at how Marcus Garvey was able to do it. Marcus Garvey had his own newspaper. He had his own media, mm -hmm. so he could deliver his message. Yeah. And in the 1920s, the circulation of his paper from the United States was 500 weekly in Belize. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge thing. Yeah. To the point that his publication was uh, creating a problem for the politics mm -hmm. in Belize, they decided to ban his paper in 1920. And on the banning of that newspaper from Belize is how the UNA was founded in Belize as a form of revolt to a need that already existed. Yeah. In other words, that void still exists today, and it's probably even bigger. Yeah. 
Back then, we had a Negro world that was writing and bringing international uh, political platform to a local country called Belize. Mm. And it don't exist today. Uh, we have the, the UBAD was founded here in, in, at the Liberty Hall. And I'm, I'm, when I look at their founding papers, it is the, basically a rework of the incorporation documents of the UNIA. Uh, but we don't give justice to the philosophy mm -hmm. or the record that exists so that the public can then use it to determine. We have a media that is advertising something other than self-reliance, something other than liberation, something other than love, truth, peace, freedom, justice, mm -hmm. because that is not the criteria for the particular house or, 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 or organization. And that's something I'd like to ask you, in terms of the criteria. Mm -hmm. The reason why, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why all of these organizations, the PUP, NIP, UBAD, were all formed out of Liberty Hall is because at that time, what was relevant was in fact the demographics of the country. Belize was majority a Creole or Afro-descent nation. Mm -hmm. So it had a relevance and footing then. If you look at now, black people, to the extent of demographics, are a minority, a significant minority, whether it be by race or it be by association. There's been intermingling, there's been a reduction. The number of people they can identify as Creole. Isn't, let's, let's say some others to argue that, listen, some of what you're saying is historical romanticism. It's, it's nostalgia. You're talking about the past. It has no relevance now. Um, and if it did, then it would be promoted. And it would have a footing. What would be your response? Well, <laughs> my response, again, is very simple. The, the, the fact that Garveyism produced political parties even before we had on record major, the major political parties, says that, in fact, something else has transpired within a particular time. Because Garvey lived until 1940, uh, June 10, and then we have uh, uh, the World War, and then we have uh, adult suffrage, and then we have these particular steps. Well. We lost something. We lost several things. We lost some of the, the spiritual will of Garveyism from Belize in, in the sense that uh, we lost Samuel Alfred Haynes. We lost uh, Sovereignists. We lost, and these were icons in developing an awareness for work and labor in, our, in the days when we needed to recognize that, in fact, the laborer, the common laborer, is important. And I think that's why Garvey, in his developing bell hops, doormen, uh, laundry shops, tailors, shoemakers, he was showing us that, in fact, and most of his contributions were 50 cents and 25 cents. But it came from a mass movement. Yeah. We, don't have, we don't have the awareness for us to even consider a critical mass. Here's my question. UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association, I don't think there could be a more relevant time for an association yeah. of that sort. Mm -hmm. I was telling you before we went to the break, I hear more people in my generation speaking about Black Lives Matter, which is a recent US born movement. So it seems to me, or it would give one the impression that there is a demand for Afro-descendants, any, any Afro-descendant, whether identified or not, that they want something to help to improve their own presence. So my question is, 100 years is a long time. And like anything else, there has to be an evolution of the message. There has to be something that connects with those who historically followed Garveyism to those who perhaps need the core principles of it today. What, what, is, what is 
how do you explain the relevance of it in today's world, where some people may not call themselves Creole, but they are Afro-descendants. And in fact, we would venture to say quite a number of people in Belize, whether they look it or not, are Afro-descendants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you make the message relevant today? Well, we are in the period, we're five years into the period of the decade of African descendants right now. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes uh, after a series of conferencing starting in 1997. The mm -hmm. Durban uh, resolutions came out of Durban, Africa, 1997. Mm -hmm. Belize was present. Mm -hmm. There's a lady in Belize by the name of Ms. Gamero, along with some government officials that went to that conference and participated. And subsequently, we have stayed in the foray of the discussion. Uh, but closer to home, I want to say that the, the magnitude of, this, the, of the work of Yubad and Evanix Hyde and Justice and Shabazz and Bert Tucker and Norman Ferrida and these brothers who we don't hear their names, they were 15, 18, 20 year old young people leading a movement. Those stories have to be told so that these young people will know that at age 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, they can lead. Samuel Haynes was 20 years old when he was called upon to quell the ex servicemen riot. These are young people, but the young people's story is not being told. So we have to have our young people begin to use this social media. Since okay, but, but see, this is, this is, this is, it's interesting, because even when you talk of a 20-year-old leading, leading a movement, we speak about that with young people here all the time. The challenge is, who takes up the lead? I guarantee you, Emerson, the young people, unless it's given as an assignment, won't go digging for it and promote it. Unless they have a, a, a conscious background or perhaps parents that help to keep them updated with what the past and what history, what took place in history. So where we, we have a void in leadership. We have a uh, void. Hold on, let's let's uh, let's let's go there because uh, I think because I've been trying to avoid this question. Uh, this, but, I, we, <laughs> but we can't keep on throwing. Things we're not going to avoid it anymore. Someone has we're to. Gonna be, if we keep on saying someone, nobody's going to do it. So, no so, so, so let's let's do it. I yeah. I did not come here to do this, but we're going <laughs> to do it. You asked me off camera a I, question. And let me ref let me Please. let me let me state the question on camera if you allow me. Uh -huh. Would you agree? that we do not have a leader of the black movement in Belize. Therefore, we don't have a black leader. We have people with black skin, but we don't have somebody in Belize who is the leader of the black movement. Okay. I agree with you, and I agree with you on this because spiritually, when one say leader, we're talking about someone who is ready to lay his life down for a cause. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. But we have been systematically watered down over the last, I have to say, since World War II to right now. And in a particular period between World War II and 1970, some critical things happened in Belize that, that we still have not recovered from. Uh, the hurricane and then the, and then the uh, uh, migration of what we would call the, the blood, the lifeblood for Belize self-sufficiency, left. And when that left, you're talking about a, create, a great void. A great void was created that still has not been fixed. Then we do not have an education program that is geared towards self-reliance or self-sufficiency or industry, or our own human development program that, that can address that situation that we're speaking of. Now, I myself have been doing civil disobedience in Belize uh, in response to some particular cases, Supreme Court cases, 3.34 uh, million Courtney case that has not ever been, like it just went up in thin air, uh, some murders, the the Nora Param case that should be fixed, and other things in our community that would bring social focus 
on people, condition, and leadership, because it is leadership that will, that will develop. And the leadership must direct its, its focus on its young people and its elders. So the elders' story has to be told, and the young people's uh, uh, cause has to be addressed by leadership. Yeah. Now, people like me, when I, when I do civil disobedience, I get quickly. Because but, nobody but, wants to, because nobody wants to hear that there is a consciousness, that there is a really right or wrong way to do this. But let's just let's just uh, qualify this here. When mm -hmm. you speak leadership, mm -hmm. I think the automatic assumption people will have is political leadership. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're speaking about? Yes, ma'am. So you need you would in order to move the movement forward. Uh, you are saying that there has to be a political will to mm -hmm. make this a part by of the UNIA and organization as oh. such. Okay. And then okay. by the government. You're not talking about actual politicians mm -hmm. taking up the. Okay. No, I'm, no, I just wanted no, to be able no, to clarify no, that. Yeah. No. I'm talking about organizational leadership, and I'm talking about the governmental politics that must use its social policies and its and its other economic and other policies See, to to connect. There's this, I love this, there's a book that talks about the power of why, Simon Sinek. One of the most important things you need to bring people together is not how it should be done, it's wow. why it should be done. Yeah. We as human beings want to connect with a cause, and it's from business to organization to social movements, mm -hmm. everything. We want to connect with a reason why. In today's society in Belize, where our demographics have changed significantly, mm -hmm. and there are more, I would venture to say, mixed race people who want to embrace all elements of themselves, why is it important that any person who is a descendant from Africa should want to unite under this cause today? Because in, 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 in these times, it's critical for us to unify. We've, we've had these meetings, like I said, since 1997 that has brought us to a name Afro-Descendiente in Spanish, yeah. an African descendant in English. And it, it signifies that, in fact, this conversation is taking a shape, it's mm -hmm. taking a form. And it's in every country right now. I recently was uh, called to become an initiator of Pan-Africanism in Belize mm -hmm. from the region. And I have said I would do that work. Mm -hmm. And what is that saying? It is saying that internationally, there is somebody else looking at this little country called Belize. And Belize has a particular significance, but we have not, in our own local uh, uh, area, recognized it. It is saying that we have not uh, given Evan X Hyde his due. We have not given Bert Tucker his due. We have not given Lassell Bowen his due. We have not given these people who tread in these particular channels yeah. their due. And in fact, if we have not given them their due, we are not able to, to impress on our young people mm -hmm. the significance of Garveyism or the significance of being an Afro-descendant. Mm -hmm. And while that is happening, you have the international political will, and I have to call this weaponized international political will, that is criminalizing and bastardizing our young people. I say that because when, when we see our census, we see mestizo, Latino, Garifuna, Creole, uh, and on and on. And in fact, we're talking about one human race. And it is because it's one human race that we must now defend this position. Whether we're going to be African descendant, Garifuna Creole, is of no significance. We're going to have to take it on as a collective, a unified collective, so that we can address these situations. In three years ago, we tried to do it in Belize. Three years ago, 28 or 30 organizations met at the Venezuelan Culture uh, Ambassador Tucker Salon. Mm -hmm. 
at the mm. Venezuelan embassy. What were we doing? It was the 27th, 28th of January, 27th, 2017, we met. NKC, NGC, and all of the other organizations. And do you know what the biggest fight was? Who bigger than who? <laughs> <laughs> NGC will not submit to NKC, and NKC will not listen to, to Belize Action Community. And, but that is not different from what happened when we had the Black Summit. When we had the Black Summit, one of the biggest arguments was which food we're going to eat, tapau or, or rice and beans. <laughs> and we're talking about a Black Summit. You see what I'm saying? So we simplify... Mm -hmm. and reduce ourselves based on these names that we've been called, thieves, vagabonds, and, and, and the like. I must say, if you allow me, I'd uh -huh. have to, I have to say kudos to the work that you're doing mm -hmm. because, and kudos to some of the names that you've called, even though some of them, the last relative thing they did was before they died or some of them was many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are in the twilight of their years. And I think a lot of them, of names you've called, really look forward to the new generation taking up the cause because they see the relevance of it. Make, make, let me stick this but to you. Just, just hold one second. Sure. I tell people, and recently I had a meeting with some young people at the Liberty Hall because we, we are actually building an institution there right now. Mm -hmm. We have classrooms there. We are getting ready to stream university work from five universities to Liberty Hall mm -hmm. right wow. now. Cool. And I have to thank the government because they gave us the fiber optic capacity mm -hmm. so that it can happen. I have to thank the Ministry of Education. I don't know. Actually, I don't know who did it. Because I was called one morning on a Saturday, uh, please come to Liberty Hall because the BTL team is there and they want to do X, Y, Z. Because I had written a letter requesting, yeah. making the request. Yeah. So I really don't know who did it. Thank you. Yeah. Because we now have the, the capacity to upload and download information from Alabama University, McGivers, New York, UWI, Jamaica, Panama National, Huracan, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And we are actually going to be able to do bachelor's and master's programs. When it comes time for face-to-face, -face, you'll do your work here. But when it comes time for your examinations, you may have to do face-to-face -face time in the particular and, locations. And you know you preempted me because that's exactly where I was going. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I wanted to piggyback off something Marlene, Marlene was talking about, which is when you have an oppressed people, um, what allows you to speak with credibility is when you have a track record of success. Mm -hmm. um, we can't speak to the young people and tell them Garvison when they don't know what it is mm -hmm. and they see no evidence of it having any success. Mm -hmm. At a year 100, it shouldn't be a conversation about finding yourselves. And I know, and that's why I started off my question with what I said, which is the hard work that you guys, you in particular, yeah. are doing. Because to deal with an enslaved people that come out of a system which allows them to fight and quarrel and be divided to try to unify them is something phenomenal. Well, it's, not, of Garb it's not bad either. I have to tell you that that fighting is not bad. I'll explain why I'm going to tell qualify this for you right now. Recently, me and some young people agreed to agree to come together. And within 72 hours, I was asking them to leave. <laughs> not only asking them to leave, but I was actually helping them to leave. Because we have to start with a willingness, with the willingness to work together and to work through any situation that may arise. And they did not, they said yes, but they did not take into themselves the real magnitude of saying yes to unifying and working together. So when we began to talk and you heard the words and the, and the activity was not congruent, I said, listen, this is not going to work. So you guys can go, you guys can host your stuff with us and we'll keep it, but you guys can go back to where you came from and consider what it is you're agreeing to do. So we disbanded and reformed in about a couple of weeks where we had a meeting with the president, David Obi, myself, and the youngsters, and we cleared away the junk. Mm -hmm. And we came back together with a re-energized body and mind that if you go to the Liberty Hall and see what they've done in five days right now, you will be amazed. They literally clean in that yard, and I'm not talking about money being paid. I'm talking about somebody taking their time, their heart, and their talents 
and putting it to work so that the younger people who will come later will have a space and will see. But guess what else we're doing? We're documenting these meetings. It's a piece of research. What is it taking for us to win this fight? Is being documented right now. And I will share that at different times with the public. What, what, what ongoing projects uh, does at the, the moment, UNA have so that we can advertise to young black males and say, this is what we're doing. In this Belize? Is, in Belize. This is the success we've been having. This is the progress we've been making. Come and join us. You will have that now, and you're probably not going to get it from me. <laughs> because I am practicing to take a back seat oh. and have these young people yeah. who are giving me the space to teach. Mm -hmm. And if, if what I'm teaching works, then they will say it works. Mm -hmm. I am not going to be the one that say it works. So we are now creating the facilitators who will be working in community with the public to make this awareness become our reality yeah. over the next uh, few years. I don't think there's a better time for momentum to build on the work that you have been doing and that you want to do as you lead up to the 100th anniversary. How do people, or why should any young person um, seek you out, seek out the other young people who are involved and join this movement? Why now? They should because it is their need. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a need. Uh, and I believe that when they may not have listened to me, another young person closer to their age group will be able to impress on them. I may not be able to do that. And I am not even trying to do that right now. What I'm trying to do is the necessary research so that, in fact, the information is available, is available to the next group of youngsters mm -hmm. who will speak based on fact, mm -hmm. not some ideological uh, mumbo-jumbo like mm -hmm. people would <laughs> like us to believe. Uh, it's mumbo-jumbo until you begin to collate the information yeah. and put it yeah. together. And, and that's what we're doing right now. All right. How do people contact you? Uh, we have a, a new email, which I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm going to do, I'm going to send that, back, okay. that package back to you guys. Okay. Uh, but my number is 629-8751. Uh, the, the other information I will make public okay. shortly because this is a very liquid uh, moment for us right now yeah. as, in fact, we are storming to make the Marcus Gabby birthday on Friday. Yeah. It would be beautiful to have Channel 5 okay. maybe get... A, a snip for, uh, for your news mm -hmm. because we are going to have uh, uh, where we've asked the mayor and we're waiting for his for his uh, approval to do a welcome at 8 o'clock on Friday morning we're asking the UNIA president we're asking the Minister of Culture Youth and Sports mm -hmm. and we're waiting for their approval uh, to begin this what we are going to call this rebirth because it is vitally important that we work together with our government mm -hmm. in a process that mutually benefits all. All right. Thank you so much for coming in this morning and having this conversation. Man, I thank you. You guys asked the right <laughs> question. <laughs> and that, that, that We're going to go ahead and take a break. <laughs> and when we come back, we'll be joined by the judges of KTV The Remake. So stay tuned. Great.